This is Bob Bates speaking. The following article was put in the paper by Pete Ferrelli, a well-known Norwalk reporter. The following is a documentary of my many films and tapes of the 30s, 40s, and 50s. This is a view from my boat yard, looking towards East Norwalk. The stacks and the water towers on the horizon was, was those of the Het Corporation of America, where I worked for seven years until the Depression came along and all but closed down the hat-making business in Norwalk. I was laid off. The long building on the East Norwalk shore was that of the Anderson Boatyard. There was an explosion in fire in, in 38 and killed Mr. Anderson. This was the rundown boatyard that I had to fix up for low rent and bring the business back again. The trains of the Danbury line went right by my door. Shelton's boat, just coming through the bridge. This is his first trip with his new boat since his old boat, the Buddy, almost sank in the middle of the sound after midnight. To help me out in these hard times, Ed Marsh gave me a few days' work once in a while. put me atop of this chimney to chip brick for brick, while down below they were cutting the gash in the chimney to drop it in the lot. They were loading bricks in the truck, the edge of the chimney, down into the chimney. This is a view from atop the chimney. When this train came along, the chimney started to quiver. So I got down in a hurry, just in time to see it fall. Everybody was running. One poor chap got inside of the building thinking that he would be safe, and the walls crashed down on him. This is how it looked after the dust cleared. This is the buddy that almost sank in the middle of the sound after midnight. With my boat out of commission, I got a hold of Bill McGee, and with his boat and extra pumps, we went out and towed him back safely. This is the gray boat that we used, belonging to Bill McGee. This is my boat. This boat was also involved in a daring rescue in the middle of the harbor. With brother-in-law Al Plum with me as my crew, we crashed through the ice and got to where the men were. The firemen with their ladders failed to get them. I pulled them onto my boat. When I got back to dock, I found out my boat was sinking pretty fast.
This is a view towards Parker Boathouse, just down from my place. And here is how my boat, the H-140, wound up on the beach after the rescue. With the depression getting worse, many people were out of work. In the winter of 1934, the government started a WPA star fishing project in the Noah Harbor around the island. My boat was put on the payroll and with a crew of six men, we were to clean up the starfish from the public oyster bed. However, after the rescue, a hard winter set in and the starfish project was closed down. The cakes of ice along the river were more than four feet thick. This is a view down the river. From the middle of the river, goes my boat on the beach with my outhouse right there in the center. When I heard of this icebreaker that was trying to break a channel out by Dawn's Point, I walked down the river on the ice and through the bridges. When I got opposite Raydell's Oyster Company, a Ford passed me on its way out to see the icebreaker. And here is the board out there by the icebreaker. And he would get up speed and then jam on his brake and slide around. Here is the icebreaker. It would back up and slam into the ice and then break up no more than three or four feet at a time. And the ice here was two feet thick. many people on the ice that day enjoying themselves by skating and walking around and watching the icebreaker. Then the blizzard came in February and just about covered my boat up. I was not able to bring my boat up ashore because my boat yard was full and there wasn't a cradle left. This is a path we dug out to the main path, main road from the lumber company to Harbor Ave. And that was my winch that I mounted on a Maxwell chassis to haul out my boat. This is another path we had to dig with my little son there to show you how deep it was. We had to dig this to our outhouse. This is the Pittsfield Express plowing through two feet of snow during the blizzard. This train was a non-stop train from New York to South Norwalk and then to Danbury and Pittsfield. This truck was stuck on the tracks 
and we were trying to get it loose. And we had to go down and flag down this oncoming train. My milkman, Mr. Stewart, died on the same cross. The lumber company plowed away this road up to Harbor Avenue. Spring was back again as usual. My little boy was enjoying a night nice spring morning. All the boats were back in the water again, and this gave me the opportunity to pull out my boat for repairs with new planking and a new cabin. Then the big boats start coming up the river again. And the Bell Island, that was winter storage, up near Wall Street, was on its way back to New York for its first run from New York to Roten Point Park. The Bell Island brought many people from New York to Roten Point Park for many years until the war broke out. Then it was used by the United States to haul troops across the English Channel, where it finally was sunk. four-masted schooner came up the river, it was quite a sight when it docked alongside my boatyard at the lumber company to unload lumber from Canada. And my boat was finally back into the water with no planking and a new mid-deck cabin. Roten Point Park, the prettiest park on Long Island Sound. These steamers are from New York with their cargo of fun seekers. This is the beautiful bathing pavilion. And the dance hall right off the beach was known as the finest in the state of Connecticut. The roller coaster. merry-go-round. This is the picnic park. There was more than a hundred tables here for the picnickers. My little girl likes to roam, and here she is wandering around.
The steamers were all loaded again, and this is the Belle Island with its cargo of fun seekers. Back home to New York. Mayor Stack was famous for his picnics at the airport in the 30s. Mayor Stack greets all his city officials. Suds Bridge with his suds. Here was Tony the street cleaner. Everybody loved him. And Thorpe the policeman. I guess he had just a little bit too much. The kids were all having fun, too. It was fun for all. Even the little tots with their soda pop.
This is the famous Rondefoo restaurant on Wall Street in the 30s. We took movies here on Saturday and showed them on the following Wednesday evening. The music in the background is Sutton Bill, who played many years together and were almost a living legend while they were still active. had a good time in this place every weekend. Be happy again. Keep on smiling. Cause when you smile. This was the famous Sonny Artell. He was well liked by everyone in Norwalk and could have been mayor. Sunny again, acting up as usual. Piano player was the famous Charlie Humphreys. Jack 
comedian on his break. He was a favorite at the rendezvous.
and this is the top hat on South Main Street. Avanuski and Weeks built more than a hundred homes in Nowhere. When Eleanor was ready to leave for Florida, Charlie Weeks gave her a farewell party at the Ashoti Yacht Club. I worked for Weeks for many years. It was the Control Brothers, a popular band in Norwalk. This was nightlife in Norwalk in the 30s and the 40s. Weeks and Tavanuski, the rendezvous crew, this was nightlife. When Wendell Wilkie was on his presidential tour. He stopped at Matthews Park, and the crowd were there waiting for him. Here he comes. I had a time jammed up in the crowd, and I was jostled around while I tried to take these pictures. This was the excavation for the Merritt Parkway around 1938. This was near the Silver Mine Fall. Governor Cross opens the Merritt Parkway. Governor Cross was here with Mayor Stack of Norwalk, and that's him in the white suit and hat. And here comes Governor Cross the, with the white hair. I was up in the tree, as you can see, to get out of the crowd so I could get better pictures. I was working near the airport on WPA and heard the crash and got these pictures. This was the first air mail out of Norwalk, and the postmaster's just putting the bag of mail in the plane at Norwalk Airport.
This is the 1940 Christmas Balloon Parade. M E R R Y X M A S spelled Mary Xmas. Looking north on West Avenue towards the YMCA building. Dragon will get you. This is Gulliver. He was too tall, so they had to lay him down and drag him along. And here's Santa Claus and the beautiful Christmas lights in South Norwalk and Norwalk and the beautiful window displays. In the summer of 1950, Norwalk was all set for its 300th tricentennial celebration. City Hall and all the city was decorated and the people gathered to watch the parade. This was my family. My kids were on the roof of the building in front of our home on West Avenue.
On this float was a 30-inch television set of the future. Downtown never looks like this anymore.
1950, there was a second parade during the tricentennial, which was later in the summer. This parade came down West Stabna into South Norwalk. In 1955, the Norwalk Business District was all but wiped out by the hurricane and floods that hit Connecticut in September.
This building is on the corner of Main and Wall Street, where WNLK had its studio. The Danbury tracks were all washed out. much widespread damage. This is the Cross Street Bridge. The Noah Cat Company where I worked. Tunnel under Walt. I do not feel this documentary can be complete without a dedication to those Norwalkers who served and died in our country's service. This film is about a father who served in World War II and lived to see his only son die in Korea. All the relatives were here gathered at Uncle Ed Bennett's farm to welcome Al. Al was a crew on my Darren rescue in the harbor. Al was on leave before going overseas. This is Al. Brother-in-law Ed Marsh Steeple Jack was here also on leave. Remember the ill-fated chimney job? This is Junior, Al's only son, waving with Robert, my son, at his side. Here is Ed Marsh and his wife, Harriet. Farmer Ed Bennett's wife feeds the baby. Al has a primpin from his nephew. They show off their tattoos. Ed should be commended for a brave deed. When lightning struck the cross on St. Mary's Church, while the storm was still raging, he lashed it to the tower to keep it from falling in the street. Farmer Ed Bennett returns to meet his guests. Leonard Bassett was also here with his girlfriend. He, had he was like a son to us. Even the farm animals were celebrating on this day. The dog was after the cat and the rooster was jealous. Ed Bennett tried to make a farmer out of me. Ed was now out taking care of his cow. taken with a group by Aunt Harriet. Little did these kids realize that some of them someday would have to go in the service of their country. And the farm dog wanted to show off too on this day of celebration. And he showed off his little pups, which were only about three days old. And Ed Marsh and his wife, Harriet, would not be outdone by a dog. Eva and Aunt Mildred show off the twins. And Grandma watches.
Albert is digging for worms while Junie with the fish pole watches. Junie thinks of his father leaving. In 1951, son Robert returned from combat in Korea. I was downtown one day and I met Mayor Freeze and I told him that Robert was coming back and we were having a party for him. He said he would be glad to be there and welcome Robert home, which he did. And this is Robert's beautiful cake. It was his birthday too. Mayor Freeze and Robert both study the cake. These were the beautiful silks that Robert brought back with him from Japan. We pay tribute and dedicate this film to the brave Norwalkers who served in their country's service. Joni was only 17 when he was sent to Korea. Like Robert, Al came home, but Junie died in his machine gun nest in Korea.